To an outsider, North Korea can be puzzling. There are 10 lane highways, but you don't see many cars. They are proud to claim a high literacy rate, but there's not enough books to go around. And surrounded by fields of corn, there's a nursery school, but four-year-old Cho is so malnourished, he is too weak to stand up. It's a cruel irony to be hungry in the middle of what they call the cereal bowl of North Korea. But most of the population here live in cities, and four-fifths of the country is mountainous and barren. Every kernel of corn and grain of rice grown here is counted on to feed the entire country. Last winter was particularly cold, and the earlier crop of potatoes and barley was poor, so rations have been cut to a few small potatoes a day per person, almost one-third of what they were. To make matters worse, recent heavy rains and typhoons have been wreaking havoc, destroying roads and bridges. 64-year-old Zogan has just retired, but now must rebuild his home. He told me that he and his family barely escaped alive when the roof collapsed during a recent storm, and he now sleeps under plastic sheeting draped over some rescued furniture. This field of rice is almost entirely rotted from the rain. Local officials are alarmed. They say in Changdong province, almost 60 percent of the rice crop has been lost. The flooding and cold winter is hitting the most vulnerable the hardest. The number of malnourished children being admitted to the Haiju Pediatric Hospital has increased by 50 percent. Polluted water has brought on diarrhea and skin disease. But even in the best of times, North Korea struggles to feed itself. These boys at Haiju's orphanage are old enough to be in high school, but they look much younger. It's the knock-on effect of chronic hunger. There is a very high rate of children and also adults who are actually much shorter than you would expect them to be. And why does this happen? Because it's a, a long story of suffering. These seven-year-olds are staying indoors today. They are too weak to play outside. They will receive an extra meal, but it's not enough. The World Food Program supplies soy to the school but it's running out. The World Food Program is here in order to assure, to do fact-finding missions in order to be able to reliably tell the international community that the help is first of all needed, and second, that it reaches the children that it's meant for. This factory usually produces fortified biscuits for children. WFP supplies the wheat, oil, sugar, vitamins, minerals, and spare parts, but it had to stop production when the wheat ran out. Food is on the way, but it's in a race against time. This ship is carrying more than 11,000 metric tons of wheat from WFP. Some will go to the biscuit factory, so every grain must count. What North Korea can't produce, it must import. And with rising food prices and limited trading partners, it's increasingly dependent on the international community to fill the gap. For Cho and his friends, it makes no difference where the food comes from. What does matter is that the next generation won't be lost to hunger. For Hungry Planet, I'm Jonathan Dumont. Planting season in Moldova, fertile soil and sunshine are among this country's only natural resources. During the Soviet era, Moldovan crops were highly valued. Now, after 20 years of independence, it's the poorest nation in Europe. And another natural resource fuels the economy. About one quarter of Moldova's 4.5 million people work abroad, sending money home to sustain families. 
The biggest impact has been on the income of communities. Because those people who migrated stopped working in agriculture, revenue collected for local budgets has gone down, and this has had a direct impact on development. With less money to spend, rudimentary advances are being overlooked in rural communities, where 60% of the population continues to live. Roads are bad, water is still drawn from wells, and many drive horse-drawn carts. Many villages like Antoneshti are now populated by old people raising children. When seven-year-old Vladut's parents left to work in Italy two years ago, he stayed behind with his grandmother. Of course, and for us and not only for Vladut, it was very difficult. Almost two years have gone by since they've left. Today, Vladut's grandmother can no longer take care of him. 15,000 Moldovan children are in similar situations, according to one government report. Fortunately for Vladut, his cousin has agreed to take him in. Alexandru understands the pressure migration places on families. He spent more than a decade working abroad. When I worked in Portugal, my daughter Diana, who was very little then, was just learning to say her first words. During one telephone conversation, she said, if you don't come home, I will hit you. Her words touched me so deeply that I decided to quit my job once and for all and come home. But coming home meant unemployment. Although remittances make up one-third of Moldova's GDP, little is actually invested in business activities or changes that might create jobs. Alexandru had a plan. When I came home, I did something that was very important to me and quite important to the village. I began designing a system that would supply water to the village. With support from EFAD, a United Nations agency working to finance job creation in rural communities, Alexandru formed a water users association and began building the network of pumps and pipes that would deliver drinking water directly to village homes. Without water, our economy could not be developed. But then, when we installed the water tower with support from IFAD, several small businesses started up, which meant new jobs were created. One of those small businesses is run by Mihai Opre. With a steady supply of water and a small loan from IFAD, he built several greenhouses and now grows tomatoes and cucumbers bound for local markets. Investing in more than 900 new enterprises like this one, IFAD's country program manager, Abdel Karim Sma, says agriculture offers the greatest potential for job creation in Moldova. We believe that our projects have created about 5,000 jobs directly. These are full-time jobs. The dream of uh, uh, earning a, a better living and uh, improving your conditions by uh, going outside the village is still prevalent, but uh, we, we've seen a, a reverse trend and we've seen young people coming back thanks to the support of uh, the government uh, as well as donors who are uh, trying to provide uh, uh, incentives. The idea that Moldovans living abroad may one day have good reason to return home and be reunited with their families is appealing, particularly for children like Vladut. For Hungry Planet, I'm James Heer. Less than 50 years ago, this land was lush savanna. But here, as in much of the Sahel, the 5,000-kilometer belt of land that divides the Sahara Desert from the rest of Africa, vegetation has been disappearing. Climate change leading to prolonged periods of drought, land degradation caused by over-farming and over-grazing, as well as deforestation, have turned this once fertile land into desert. But a recent project to plant acacia or gum trees is attempting to reverse that process of desertification. Before the project, the trees that had been here during the time of our ancestors had disappeared. Since we got trees and tolls from the project, it's easier for us 
to walk the land and put food on the table. Fatou Say is one of 150 women in this village alone, benefiting from a project begun in 2004 by the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, or FAO, together with the Forestry Department of Senegal and five other countries across the region. FAO provided seeds and seedlings and taught them how to sow and plant the acacia trees, as well as how to extract and market the gum they produce. Acacia is a, a good choice for the project because it is a native tree, so we are not altering biodiversity. It's a tree which has many benefits. It feeds the soil, so it restores its fertility. It is a shelter for crops. It is also providing gum arabic, which has an international market and good for the economy. It also provides fodder for livestock and also food for uh, also the local communities. <laughs> The benefits we have received from the project are enormous. People from surrounding villages come here to see what we're doing. We are producing hibiscus juice, peanuts and millet which we sell at the market. With that money, we are investing in the villages to build them in. And now that the acacia trees have reached maturity, the women have also begun extracting and selling the gum for processing. Through a middleman, their gum arrives at this processing plant, close to Senegal's capital, Dakar, from where the gum is sold to Europe, the US and elsewhere. It's a growing industry because of the demand and because of all different uses in pharmaceutical and food industries, such as in confectionery, dairy products and soft drinks. There is a very long list of uses. Based on the success of the Acacia project, FAO is now in search of funding to roll the project out on a wider scale to re-green more of the land bordering the Sahara Desert. If successful, the initiative will keep the desert sands at bay and provide protection for the millions of vulnerable people living within Africa's drylands. For Hungry Planet, I'm Charlotte Windle.